Good morning uh, or good afternoon. Welcome all to the fourth of the five part webinar series on the new concept of the corporation jointly hosted by Research Institute of Economy, Trade and Industry, RIETI, European Corporate Governance Institute, ECGI, and Waseda University Institute of Business and Finance, WBF. Uh, my name is Iko Suzuki and I am Associate Director of WBF and Research Member of ECGI. Thank you for participating in the webinar. Uh, over the last few years, and particularly since the onset of COVID-19, the purpose of the cooperation has been the subject of active debate. On the occasion of the publication of the Japanese translation of Professor Colin Mayer's book, Prosperity, Better Business uh, Makes the Greater Good, in April, with the Japanese translation titled Kabushiki Gaisha Kihan no Kopernik Steki Tenkai by Toyoke Zaishin Posha. Rieti, ECGI, and WBF have been jointly organizing a webinar series on the new concept of the cooperation, the EU UK experience, and its lessons for Japanese corporate governance reforms. The message of Colin's book is crystal clear that instead of former uh, shareholder value maximization, solving the problems with profitable way should be set as the purpose of the corporation. For realizing this transformation to purposeful firm, Colin suggests that ownership, governance, measurement of performance, that is accounting system, corporate strategy, law and regulation, all uh, should be coherently redesigned. Based on his proposal, this webinar series has been structured as follows. Episode one addressed the concept of the new corporation. Episode two examined the corporate law and the role of directors. Uh, focusing the fiduciary duty of directors. Episode three and four address the relevant ownership structure and governance. And last episode addresses the corporate strategy uh, for purposeful firms. Episode four deals with the parallel ownership of long-term shareholders, shareholding of portfolio uh, companies. Let's see. Okay. Uh, with four distinct speakers and commentators. Oops, sorry. Uh, Professor Colin Mayer from University of Oxford and ECGI, Rainer Gibson, University of Geneva, Swiss Finance Institute and ECGI, Christina Amejan, uh, Amejan uh, Hitotsubashi University, uh, Yuki Ikehata, Asset Management One, and Q&A session will be moderated by Malko Becht uh, from University Libre de Bruxelles, ECGI, and Hideaki Miyajima, uh, my colleague at Waseda University and Rieti. So a little bit about the background. Ownership takes various form around the world. There's concentration versus uh, insider and outsider type of uh, uh, framework is not enough. The distinction between block ownership versus dispersed ownership, block versus dispersed, as well as committed versus less committed shareholders should also be considered. Out of Collins' preposition, solving the problems profitable ways, solving the problem is supported by committed insider shareholders like family, foundations, and group, uh, group uh, companies while the, uh, the profitability itself is the main concern of the uh, outside shareholders, uh, portfolio investors. So in the context of, context of Japan, the shareholder structure is shifting from domination by insiders, this is before, and uh, it's shifting toward more outsider oriented shareholder structure. So episode three already addressed the role of activist funds. It was the last episode. And then this episode will focus on insurance firms and passive index funds uh, in comparison with that of block corporate insiders such as industry foundation and corporate ownership. Today, we are going to discuss following five points. First, current situation of this institutional investors. 
Outsider dominated dispersed ownership by institutional investors is not the right description for the current ownership structure, even in the US and UK, since big three BlackRock, uh, Vanguard and State Street uh, counted for more than 20% uh, of S&P 500 firms. On the other hand, in continental Europe and Japan, institutional investors have been increasing uh, uh, where insider ownership such as family, foundation, and main banks uh, and uh, corporate ownership used to be common. Understanding the current characteristics of ownership structure is the starting point of this episode. Second, uh, conceptually understanding the new role of the institutional investors. Who are the committed investors? Along with corporate insiders, could the index passive funds or insurance companies become committed owners and how their engagement could be effective. Why and how the engagement and stewardship in ESG activities by institutional investors can be expected given their main concern of financial returns, low fees and the free rider problem. This is the core of the issue. Both presenters will touch upon the issues. The reality of institutional investors, are they really effective? With institutional investors increasingly stress, stressing the importance of environmental, social, and governance uh, ESG issues, we discussed the reality of, uh, at the equity portfolio level, as well as the engagement level. What is the situation of the ESG sustainable finance or impact investing around the world? There are growing literatures which describe uh, the activities of index or passive institutional investors to corporate behaviors such as financial policy, CapEx and performance, and also the ESG activities. Rainer Gibson, who recently published the Do Responsible Investors Invest Responsibly, will give us insights on the reality around the world. Yuki Ikehata, representing the uh, practitioners community uh, from one of the largest uh, institutional investors in Japan, uh, will present his company efforts around ESG issues. Fourth, legal and regulation issues, dual class shares and collective engagement. To encourage an appropriate role of institutional investors, there is a series of uh, policy and regulatory issues, disclosure, by institutional investors, regulation of fund managers' fees and stewardship code and collective activities. For example, the EU Commission has taken an action plan for financial sustainable growth, while there is still ongoing discussion in the US on whether fiduciary duties should include the consideration of ESG factors. For making the engagement of institutional investors more enforceable, the regulation on the reporting of collective engagement among institutions also needs to be considered. And finally, uh, implications for Japan. Under Abenomics, stewardship code required institutional investors to engage in sustainable growth issues, while revised corporate governance code required listed firm to disclose the sustainable growth activities. Japan is just at the starting points in the sense that institutional investors began to consider those issues at the pressure of GPIF, Japanese Pension Fund, uh, while some of leading firms introduced the integrated reporting system. Are there any lessons from European perspectives to Japan? From her rich experience of serving as an external director for ja many Japanese companies, uh, Christina Amejan will explain what needs to be improved of institutional investors in Japan. With this brief summary, I'd like to hand over to uh, Professor Colin Mayer for his presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much indeed for uh, the introduction. Uh, <clears throat> so let me just start off with some facts. So. The first fact is that if one looks at listed companies around the world, that even amongst the largest listed companies, one in general observes a significant proportion of them being in the hands of 
holders of blocks of shares, block holders. That's true of most countries. It's less true of the Anglo-American markets of the UK and the US. In those Anglo-American markets, one observes what Michael Jensen in 1986 described and predicted as being the eclipse of the public corporation actually having happened by now. So this slide shows that the number of listed firms per million of population has declined from around about 30 uh, in the US and UK at the beginning of the 1990s to around about 10 today, uh, but has remained relatively stable uh, generally around the world and in countries such as Germany. And that ref has reflected, for example, in the case of the UK, a halving in the number of listed companies from 4,000 to 2,000 between 1960 and 1990, and a further halving from 2,000 to 1,000 uh, from 1990 to now, and similar features over the last 20 years in the United States are observed. Underpinning that is that the level of delistings has exceeded that of new listings, but a second observation is that while that's true in some countries, it's not true everywhere. And in particular, if one looks at Japan, one observes a growing number of listed companies on the TSE rather than a declining number. Now, in the last Rieti talk, we focused on a concentrated shareholder segment and made a number of observations, one of which is that those concentrated shareholders take a variety of different forms, sometimes families, foundations, employees, other companies, the last of those being particularly relevant to Japan today. And that there is therefore a parallel market that exists in listed companies. On the one hand, there are these concentrated block holders. On the other hand, there are liquid, short-term, predominantly institutional investors. And in the last talk, that observation was related to the governance of firms insofar as the traditional view of governance is that it's about solving the agency problem of aligning the interests of directors with those of shareholders. And that is certainly a feature of the governance and the presence of diversified liquid investors. But where there are concentrated shareholders, those concentrated shareholders may have objectives that go beyond those of purely financial returns. And in those circumstances, one can view, in some cases, the owners and boards as performing a role that is closer to that of a trustee than an agent. But notwithstanding the uh, presence of these concentrated shareholders and that they bring advantages in some respects in terms of having in particular a long-term focus, there are failures that occur in relation to those long-term concentrated shareholders. And in some cases that concentration is not so long-term. And that was what we were talking about in relation to the role of activist funds, purchasing blocks of shares, correcting underperformance, and then exiting. And we also noted that amongst those, there's beginning to emerge a feature of not only focusing on purely financial performance, but on other factors as well, which what we'll discuss shortly in relation to ESG considerations. And one recent illustration of that was the role of the small activist fund 
engine number one in uh, changing the board composition of Exxon Mobil significantly uh, over the last few weeks. So the focus of today shifts from that on what we've observed in the last talk to institutional investor stewardship and engagement. And let me start off by simply making the point that uh, if you look at funds in the US, for example, that the scale of passive uh, investment has increased appreciably in relation to that of active management, both now accounting for around $4 trillion of assets under management. And that in particular, the point I want to stress is that amongst those passive investors, the dominant form of ownership is becoming that which is being classified as essentially universal ownership. That is institutions that hold global portfolios, often in the form of indexed funds. And that means that these institutional holdings are essentially diversified international portfolios for which the relevance of even relatively large firms, individual firms, is of little or no significance in terms of the risks of the portfolio. What matters are global systemic risks of the form of climate change, political risks, regulatory risk, protectionist risks, changes in monetary policy and interest rates and things like that. And one example of this that's received quite a lot of attention is the extent to which institutional portfolios are exposed not just to financial risks, but to warming risks. So for example, recently in relation to its uh, government securities, the Bank of England set out the global warming of the investments associated with its gilts, saying that they in essence are associated with uh, a 3.5 degree centigrade global warming by the end of the century. And likewise, there are measures of global warming associated with equity portfolios, such as the MSCI index, talking about that as having a, a global warming associated with uh, 3.7 degrees by the end of the century. So what this is Im implies is that universal owners are focused on these global systemic risks and to the extent that, for example, targets will be imposed in terms of the global warming that can be associated, the maximum global warming that can be associated with any particular index fund that will have a very significant impact on the allocation of portfolios and in essence, the cost of capital of companies. So some of the most significant developments that have occurred in this regard are first of all, in relation to what the EU is doing around the Green Deal, promotion of sustainable finance, the EU taxonomy, modern financial reporting directive and various sustainability related disclosure requirements. Uh, and as a significant market, this is giving rise to what is sometimes termed the Brussels effect by which uh, legislation that's coming in and regulation in regard to these factors have implications on global funds and global companies uh, in terms of the way in which they have to essentially follow these in relation to their global activities. So how one significant market 
can have a global impact in terms of regulatory standards. The UK has pursued this agenda around forming a green bank, uh, putting forward a green finance initiative and various initiatives that are going to be associated with the COP26 meeting later this year. And there are a variety of international initiatives, for example, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, the various initiatives of central banks and supervisors on trying to green the financial system, sustainability accounting standard boards, uh, the World Economic Forum and International Business Council, uh, uh, metrics that are being set out. And in particular, and probably most significantly, what the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation is doing in terms of establishing a sustainable standards board. That is the probably the most significant because the global reach of the IFRS, uh, if it uh, comes out with standards in this area, uh, will be of greatest significance. Now to date, the majority of what has happened has been to focus on the E, the environment of ESG, but with the pandemic and Black Lives Matters and things like that, uh, the S has also come to the fore. Now, let me just illustrate that in relation to the way in which a particular company uh, is disclosing in this regard. It's the pharmaceutical company Novartis, uh, which produces uh, pharmaceutical products with an objective to improve and extend people's lives through profitable new treatments and delivery. So it measures this in terms of, first of all, the patients reached, uh, the countries where the, its products are sold, it measures its environmental impact, in particular in relation to carbon emissions, and its social impact in terms of the impact on the uh, patients reached and the effect that their treatments have on improving people's lives and extending their lives. And in particular measures the impact of those in terms of, for example, the earnings capabilities of those uh, whose health is improved and the implications for government expenditures and reducing government expenditures as a consequence of those health improvements. So to illustrate what emerges then is that they estimate their social impact as 220 billion, their environmental impact is minus 6 billion, so their total ESG impact is about 214 billion. That compares with its market capital value of 200 billion. So approximately for every dollar of financial market capital, it creates, it creates one dollar of environmental and social capital. So one can think of this as essentially an extension of a Tobin's Q measure of looking at ESG valuations, social and environmental valuations as a proportion of financial market valuations. In this case, the ratio being approximately one. But the important point I want to emphasize is that ESG is not the same as measuring purpose. It's first of all, an average assessment or a total impact assessment, whereas purpose is about solving problems and finding a link between solving those problems uh, and the performance of the firm, and in particular, identifying profitable solutions to problems, meaningful challenges that can be solved profitably. So a high average impact does not necessarily translate into a high marginal impact. For example, if it's a solved problem, a solved health problem in the case of Novartis, then the marginal impact may be low uh, where the average is high. So this is very similar to the difference between an average Q and a marginal Q. Uh, so purpose is linked to strategy, investment, and resource allocation, that is to say the extent to which there are profitable solutions, improvements at the margin. 
And in thinking about measuring purpose, one then starts with the notion of what the purpose is, why the company exists, uh, what it's seeking to do, linking that to its strategy, its mission, its vision, where it aspires to be in terms of solving problems and the values uh, that are needed to bring that about. Essentially the why is the what, the where and the how it's going to do it. And those values in particular then relate to the metrics where the metrics are not just about the traditional ones of inputs and outputs, but relate to outcomes. In the case of Novartis, for example, the number of people reached and the improvements and extension of their lives and the impacts, the impact that has, for example, on uh, earnings capabilities and well-being uh, of individuals. And that that then can be monetized in terms of accounting for the costs of delivery of those purposes and the valuation impacts, not just the financial valuation impacts, but as I was describing in relation to Novartis, it's societal and environmental impacts as well. So just thinking about this in the case of Novartis, what it means is looking at, first of all, uh, the improvement in the standards of people's lives and the extension of people's lives associated with treatments, the number of patients reached. So those together then uh, tell one about the outcomes and then the impacts are measured in terms of the, for example, GDP contribution that comes in terms of the working capabilities and earning capabilities of people affected. And in those cases of those who are not earning the implied improvements in GDP, the reductions, for example, uh, in government expenditures to support uh, other people who are not earning. So that then gives you a total gross value added impact. Okay, now in terms of the actual implementation of this, what has emerged is a serious problem in terms of a gap between what the boards of companies see themselves as doing. And I'm going to just cite some work that's come out of studies that we've been doing with uh, the boards of some of the largest European companies and North American companies and global investors. And what directors of those boards of companies say is that they're doing all they can to communicate their purpose, but investors are often disinterested in anything other than short-term profits. In particular, there's a disconnect between the portfolio managers and the ESG departments of institutional investors, confusion between ESG and purpose. But investors, on the other hand, feel that boards are not demonstrating a commitment to purpose and not providing the information that investors need to evaluate whether or not companies really are focusing on their purpose and delivering benefits, both financial and non-financial, from their purposes. So what institutional investors are seeking are assurances that boards, first of all, understand what their corporate purpose is have really defined it, that they put in place management systems to implement their purpose, that management and the board are responding to their stakeholders in terms of their stakeholders' attitudes to their, those purposes, and that they're evaluating their performance really against their purpose. And so there is a significant information gap that needs to be addressed in terms of improving the reporting between companies and investors if this is really to take effect. And the, that gap relates to information about the organization's purpose, how the board is measuring resource allocation against its purpose and its performance against its purpose. And that it's aligning that measurement then with the incentives, the remuneration and the promotion of people with its purpose. The purpose should then be the North Star and the guardrail for the company's strategy and linked to the company's strategy. It's not just something that the company does on the side. And the company stakeholders uh, are key to this and gaining response to them from them in terms of feedback on the purpose is critically important. And that is what the investors want to see. 
the values of the organization that underpin its purpose and how those values are reflected in the corporate culture and the resolution of conflicts within the organization. So those are the types of information that investors are seeking, but feel at the moment they're not really getting or not in a form that they believe is really related to evidence on the company's performance. So to sum up, what's emerging is that uh, there are these two classes of investors. First of all, there are in institutional investors focused on uh, systemic risks, uh, where ESG measures are particularly relevant for impact investing and the exposure of investors to systemic risks. That there is a considerable confusion between ESG and measuring purpose. Purpose is specific to a company, why it exists and the problems that it's seeking to solve. And purpose is a central determinant and of a company's strategy. It's key to value creation, as well as just looking at social and environmental benefits as imposing costs on companies. It should be seen to be a form of value creation from the point of view of investors. Now, systems of measuring purpose are being developed. They need to be linked to accounting, valuation, and reporting along the lines that I was just describing. There should be proper reporting on resource allocation and performance against purpose. And it's necessary in the process of defining their purposes for companies to engage with the stakeholders in determining and evaluating their purpose. Now the block holders then play a key role in terms of promoting this and encouraging companies to do this. It's not something that for the most part, diversified investors will be focused on. They will be predominantly focused quite appropriately given their systemic risk exposures on ESG measures. But the block holders in performing their trustee functions over the corporate purpose should really be focused on this. And together with the board, they then should be responsible for the delivery of the company purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, the confusion uh, between ESG and purpose and then uh, the role of institutional investors. Uh, so uh, we'd like to move on to uh, Rhino Gibson uh, for the second presentation. She will be uh, focusing uh, on the ESG issues and give uh, a, a more detailed perspective about the, the issue. Please. Can you see my screen just uh, to make yes. sure everybody seeing perfect? So I'd yes. like to yeah. thank the organizers for hosting me on this uh, fourth webinar, which is focused on the role of institutional investors. So I'm going to be presenting some of the results of a study that have been conducted with my co-authors, Simon Glossner, Philip Kruger, Pedro Matos, Tom Stephan, and myself. And I'm the only responsible for the bad outcomes in this talk. So the title of the paper is Do Responsible Investors Invest Responsibly? And uh, let me start with the motivation. It very much follows uh, what uh, Colin was saying. So nowadays we find that there's a strong growth in the interest of institutional investors for applying some kind of ESG style to their equity and their fixed income portfolios. However, we still know very little about how much they are committed to these responsible investment strategies. And we know very little about the key question that we address in this study. And we only provide some partial answers, not to disappoint you, which is whether they really walk the ESG talk, namely our words followed by outcomes by better portfolio ESG scores at the level of these institutional investors. 
So we will answer or try to answer these questions by using some novel survey data from the PRI, the Principles of Responsible Investment, which is the largest institutional network that started in 2006 with the help of the UN. Today, it has collectively about 3,000 signatory institutions who manage jointly a little bit less than 100 trillion of dollars of assets under management. So quite a substantial amount of the company's wealth or capital, both in terms of fixed income and equity. So just in case I'm cut short before the end of this talk, let me give you a preview of some of the questions and answers we're trying to provide in this paper. So question one, do PRI signatories walk the ESG talk and have better portfolio level ESG scores? Well, on average, as you will see, the answer is yes, but there's wide regional differences. So in Europe, they seem to be, and in the rest of the world, including Japan, they seem to be walking the talk. In the US, the evidence is much more mitigated. Then we ask ourselves, do these portfolio level ESG scores actually depend on the level of commitment that they display to responsible investment strategies? And I'm gonna show you how we measure this level of commitment. So again, the answer is nuanced in the rest of the world, yes. But again, in the US, we actually see that those that sign the PRI but remain uncommitted actually display even worse ESG scores than the non-PRI peers. So maybe a hint to some greenwashing, which is also going to be addressed to in this talk. So then we try to assess, well, what explains, what drives a higher level of commitment of these PRI signatories to responsible investments? Well, being located outside of the US, being located in countries with stronger environmental and social norms leads to more commitment. In contrast, those institutions that had poor past performance tend to have a weaker commitment to responsible investments. So then the question is, well, why would some institutions sign, but then don't do anything, don't walk the talk? And we try to provide an answer by saying it's business motivations, right? They are able specifically in the US to attract significantly higher flows, even if they don't do anything after signing the PRI, which is quite paradoxical and means that these institutional investors have some clients that are quite myopic in terms of what's going on. And last but not least, we try to give a typology of these greenwashing investors in the US. So we find that generally they had poor risk adjusted performance. They were more retail client centric. They had themselves higher ESG incidents in their firms and they were late joiners sort of laggards. But just in terms of the data, in terms of the data, we first use PRI data. So most studies before us have used data on the signing status, whether some institution had signed or not signed the PRI. Well, we go one step further. We dig into the survey data to look at their implementation of ESG styles across their listed equity assets under management. Then to look at the institutional investor, we need their holdings in terms of each of the company's equity. And that's given by relying on fact set lion shares. And finally, we need the ratings of the underlying firms, the ESG ratings. And uh, I've done another study with my colleague, Philip Kruger, where we find that there's strong disagreement among seven of the largest ESG data providers. So in terms of trying to mitigate that concern, we rely on three ESG data providers, Asset4, which is now called Refinitiv, Sustainalytics, and MSCI EVA. So let me show you first how we compute the ESG score at each stock or firm level. 
we basically average the Z scores. Z means normalized scores given by asset for MSCI and sustainalytics. So this gives us an average normalized score for each company represented in an institutional investor's portfolio. Then we need to aggregate those at the portfolio level of each institutional investor J simply by summing over the weights multiplied by the normalized score of each of the constituents in the portfolio of each institutional investor. And we do this analysis for their total ESG score, their environmental scores, their social scores, and their governance pillar. And higher values of that portfolio, portfolio level score, whether it's E, S, or G, means a better outcome in terms of walking uh, the talk. Okay, so just... I don't have so much time to, it's a big paper with a lot of results. So just to give you some uh, statistics about the important role of institutional ESG capital being a dominant force now in equity markets. So you see since 2006 in green on the left-hand side, a tremendous growth of these number of PRI signatories over time. And today, as I said, they represent 3,000 signatories collectively. In 2017, 60% of institutionally owned equity was actually managed by these PRI club of institutional investors. So they have a big power in not only in the US, not only in Europe, but everywhere in the world. So what we see is that where are they located? That then can be interesting for the Japanese uh, colleagues here. You see that they're mostly located outside of the US, being in Europe, and Asia is trending up as well. And in terms of the size of their assets under management, they seem to be large players with large assets under management above $1 billion of assets under management. Okay, now as to our questions. First, do PRI signatories walk the ESG talk? So here you have the density of the portfolio level total ESG scores for the PRI and the non-PRI uh, members. And you see that the curve, the green curve is actually higher in the median or the mean. And it's also shifted to the right, which seems to say that on average, they walk the ESG talk. And to look at it in more details, they seem to walk that ESG talk mostly in terms of their total pillar, in terms of the social one, and in terms of the governance one, okay? But now let's look at differences. And the differences we try to focus on because they're quite characteristic is by having on one side Europe and Asia and on the other side, the US. And you see quite a striking pattern. In the rest of the world, excluding the US, the PRI seem to have all scores being better than their non-PRI peers. Actually, in the US, it seems to be exactly the opposite. And just to give you the results of our multivariate regressions, you have this panel B above, which is for the US sample. You see that in terms of the total score or footprint, and in terms of the governance one, they do pretty much worse than their non-signing parts. Whereas in Europe, they seem to, on all fronts, have better ESG and total ESG outcomes than their non-signing peers. So clearly an asymmetry between US versus the rest of the world. Now, the, the novel survey data comes in at this point when we try to answer the second question, which is, do portfolio level ESG scores of PRI signatories actually depend on their level of commitment. And I'm going to show you in a minute how we define commitment to responsible investment. So first, how do they invest? Well, we use the taxonomy that's been used by the GSIA, by several academic studies, which basically collects 
eight different ESG styles. So there's no such a thing as one ESG style. It's like among active management. There's many different strategies. And the one we can focus on, first of all, are the screening ones. So negative screening or exclusion, positive screening, also called best in class, norms-based screening, for instance, no alcohol, no tobacco, no certain specific issues that are violating the social norms. The thematic ones being, for instance, when you go into renewable energies, into clean water, into biodiversity and so forth. Then in the middle, you have the ESG integration, which is very popular, as you will see. And at the end, you have the engagement strategies that have been studied by our colleague uh, um, in England, uh, Professor Dimson, individual and collective engagement, as well as voting uh, to promote long-term changes in a given uh, company. Now, as you can see from this graph on the left hand side, you see in terms of numbers of signatories, what are the dominant styles? Well, first of all, engagement, followed by 77% of the signatories who use ESG integration, and then followed by exclusion, 68% of the signatories. When it comes to pure asset allocation, so excluding the engagement ones and talking about assets under management, you see that a wide proportion is devoted to ESG integration, 50% is devoted to some form of screening, and a very niche strategy seems to be thematic. Note that all these strategies are not exclusive. Most of these institutional investors actually blend one or several of these styles, right? So they are combined. But what, what, what is important for us is levels of commitment. And because we had access to that survey data, we were able to partition our groups of PRI signing members into three categories. Those that are fully committed, which means they apply one form of ESG investment style to 100% of their equity under management. There's those that are partially committed, the second group, that apply to between 1% and 99% of their equity under management. And finally, the uncommitted who either don't do anything or don't report. And here again, if you look at the US versus the non-US, you see that in the non-US, there's a large fraction that are actually fully dedicated, fully committed. In the US, what's sort of interesting is that the a large proportion, 168, which represents roughly 26% of them, actually doesn't uh, is totally uncommitted, either doesn't report or doesn't do anything. Okay. So now we look at how do these level of commitments translate into portfolio ESG outcomes. And for US signatories, we find that they have no, those which have no ESG incorporation or that are uncommitted have actually worse ESG scores than their non PRI uh, peers. So perhaps a hint of greenwashing. Outside of the US, the fully committed and the partially committed do have better portfolio ESG scores. So clearly those seem to align their actions to their words, which translates into positive outcomes in terms of ESG scoring, okay? Now then we're asking the third question, which is what explains or what tilts investors towards higher commitments? And there's two key factors, as you can see, it's being located outside of the US and it's being located in a country with high world values, meaning in our case, higher social and environmental values. On the other side, what explains a lower commitment is underperformance and also to some extent here, the level of industry competition or concentration, right? So that seems to tend to lead them to commit less to ESG, even though they signed the PRI. So it seems puzzling. You sign, but you don't do anything. And the reason is, why would you sign? 
And today, everybody's surfing the wave. And it seems that in the US, you know, it's business driven. Those that actually were uncommitted but signed are able to attract the highest significant proportion of uh, you know, asset flows into their portfolios. So it seems the investors are unable to distinguish between actions and words. In Europe, it seems different. Actually, those that commit actually pay a price in terms of lower flows into their assets under management. So benefits in the US, costs in Europe and the rest of the world, a very different picture again here that we uh, observe. Now, the last uh, piece of result that I would like to show you is then we zoom in on those uncommitted PRI signatories in the US whereby we think we can detect some greenwashing. And the greenwashing is particularly uh, to be visible and positively related to having had low past performance, to having had a retail client-centric focus, to institutions who themselves had high operational ESG incidents as measured by RepRisk, and finally, institutions that were laggards. They joined later the PRIs after 2012, 2013. Remember, it started in 2006. So let me first conclude and then give you some open issues. So I think we are the first paper that uses the survey data from the PRI reporting framework, which is really a treasure of information to study the public commitment of PRI signatories to ESG equity investment style. And we try to address the question, do they really walk the ESG talk? So on average, it seems that the answer is yes, but when you drill down, you see a significant disconnect between the US and the rest of the world. In fact, PRI signatories that are in the US and that have lowest commitment exhibit worse portfolio ESG scores than their non-signing peers. We think that those uncommitted investors actually sign because it's like a cheap signal to attract investor flows and mostly probably retail flows of unsophisticated investors. And we try to give a typology of these greenwashers, which is that they had poor past performance, a retail client focus, more ESG incidents in their own firms, and were late joiners. So if you allow me, I have exactly 37 seconds, so I'm going to go very fast in the last slide. Maybe some open issues, you know, for the debate. I was thinking... First of all, I think an important question because of the predominance where ESG investment is becoming like mainstream investment is what are the social and the economic costs of greenwashing? I think this is a very pertinent uh, question. And to the extent that there is greenwashing going on at the level of the firms, but also at the level of institutional investors, how can we mitigate this? And of course, one answer being academics, we still think in terms of education, so promoting sustainable finance literacy. The problem is that, you know, there's so many vocabulary, so many expressions that people don't speak the same language here. So enhancing ESG disclosure standards is another uh, important issue. And here the European um, taxonomy and some other efforts that have been mentioned by my colleague uh, Colin Mayer are going in the right direction. Improving ESG data quality and KPI measurement, this is one obstacle that most institutional investors count as being very important. And finally, the ESG tone should come from the top of the institution. That means you have to educate the board members as well. Now, the question that the last item is, can this be achieved by market self-discipline? I think our results point to the, to the contrary. It cannot, because by signing, it's a cheap signal, but you still can be disguised as a greenwasher. So then the question is, 
can regulation or some other mechanism enforce the mitigation of greenwashing? So thank you very much. I hope I haven't been too much over my time. And uh, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Raina. Very insightful presentation. The uh, uh, glad that the uh, the people in the U.S. are not hearing probably because <laughs> it's late at night. It's it's around midnight. So, <laughs> but uh, it's it's very interesting that the uh, the U.S. They've is seen the paper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> so the uh, glad that the uh, the Asia is uh, walking the talk at least for the time being, and uh, probably uh, uh, Yuki will present there his own view about his own company uh, efforts. Okay, thank you very much. So now we move on to comments uh, from uh, Christina, uh, who has had a lot of experience in uh, serving in the board of Jap many Japanese companies. So uh, he has a lot to say about the improvement, uh, what needs to be improved out of the, uh, the institutional investors. Thank you, uh, please, uh, Christina. Hey, thank you very much. And um, Miura-san, you're going to share for me, I think, I hope. Yes, so, okay, I'm Christina Majin from Hitotsubashi University, and I'm very, very um, happy to, to be here. I'm gonna talk about some implications um, for Japan from, from my own perspective, which is a, a researcher on corporate governance as well as a, um, a, a sitter on boards, a non-executive director of, of, of multiple boards of Japanese companies. Um, Iko, are you going to time me so I know um, how I'm doing? Great, thank you. Okay, next next slide, please. Um, so my, my, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit of maybe a cynical view, but a view based on um, my experience in, in many boards, which is this, is, is Japanese business a paradise of purpose or a global outlier? And what are the implications for, for investors? And again, I'll talk about uh, my experience as a researcher, but as well as a non-executive director on Japanese boards. And I find in Japan this, this new emphasis, both on corporate purpose, as well as ESG, both encouraging, but also con concerning. And I'm gonna focus on some issues that I find kind of concerning in, in Japan. So next slide, please. So those of you in Japan um, know this already, but, um, but J Japanese business in history has a really proud record of social responsibility. And um, immediately everyone in Japan will recognize the picture of Shibusawa Eichi, well known as the father of Japanese capitalism, the first social entrepreneur, someone who said business is for society only not to make money. Um, business without integrity must be avoided. And um, many people also know, everyone also knows of the Omi merchants and their idea of Sampo Yoshi, that business must be good for buyer, supplier, and community. And this is all very wonderful. And Japan, I think, was onto purpose stakeholder capitalism before anyone else was, except, so I have a big but here, um, which is, I've lived in Japan forever, and we've only started talking about Shibusawa Eichi recently. The Omi merchants and Sampo Yoshi is something that I've, we've only started talking about recently. And so I wonder a little bit, is this really a proud record that people take seriously? Or is this an excuse by Japanese companies not to do what they need to do? So next picture, please. Next slide. So here's my butt. And so I'm going to highlight some three critical issues of concern that I have for Japanese firms, as well as institutional investors investing in Japanese firms related to this. And the first is overconfidence around purpose. It's great to have purpose. Do Japanese firms really have enough or are they overconfident? I'll also talk about the view of stakeholders here, which concerns me. I think it's a limited, very proximate view and also talk about ESG and a tendency for it to become in Japan as a box ticking exercise. So next slide, please. 
Okay, so Japan has a long history of emphasis on purpose and stakeholders. And as I said before, with Shibusawa Eiichi, some of the great founders of Japanese capitalism, um, there really has been a focus on stakeholders. But I find, and, and this may sound cynical, but I find it in the press, I find it in my own conversations with business leaders, that there's a tendency towards exaggeration. And my cynical, but I think um, there's a lot of truth in it, is that there are appeals to the past, to Japanese social capitalism as, as, as an excuse to avoid some of the current problems, which are lack of transparency, um, lack of sense of purpose and direction, and some basic issues around economic health. I find um, Japanese, at least I, I live in the world of big Japanese companies, traditional ones, and they're always, oh, we are, a stakeholder capitalist, we are not shareholder capitalists, we're doing something different, and they tend to use it to avoid dealing with some fundamental problems that still exist here in Japan. I find that this current boom around um, Sampo Yoshi and Shibusawa Eichi is a great heritage for Japan. And I think that Japan has lots of culture, resources, history of, of, of this that they can preserve and develop, that there's a homegrown culturally accepted version of ESG, at least in, in Japan, but companies have to realize that these concepts and these role models need to be updated. And so one of my roles as a non-executive director in Japanese companies is to often say, wait a second, you guys, you talk about shareholder, stakeholder capitalism. Do you really mean it? What does it mean? Is this just some um, ancient nostalgia or is it is it for real? Next page, please. Um, another issue in Japan with Japanese firms is even if we accept stakeholder capitalism as important, which it is, Japanese firms have had a pretty limited and proximate view of stakeholders. They've considered employees and communities as their stakeholders. But the problem is they tend to look at their proximate communities, in other words, their hometowns, and their own elite male employees. Um, and, and, and this is really in, contra uh, in contrast with S. Um, so, so stakeholders are males, they're the inner circle, and, and um, this is difficult for, Jap the Japanese companies are, are of course changing, it's a, but it's a struggle for them. And it's, I think it's a struggle for Japanese firms to understand and communicate their connection to the more global issues around the SDGs, around society, environment, government. Next page, please. Um, I also find, and um, this may be cynical, and this is just kind of my own um, observation, is that I find a danger of ESG reporting in Japan as an exercise in box ticking bureaucracy. And these are my personal observations. Board meetings on my boards are, which are very good in terms of ESG, but they spend much too much time on reports, reports about reports, numerical um, targets, reports about targets, the latest plan, long, 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 too little time about the essence of ES and G. And I guess um, related to Colin's um, presentation earlier, I think too little talk about purpose. It's long, long laundry lists. And I think they're doing many good things, but I don't think there's enough focus. And I think a lot of the in engagement with investors is on, okay, did this, did this, did this, did this, rather than really thinking about what's the essence, what is our purpose, how are we contributing to society, um, these, these bigger issues. And um, Japanese companies love bureaucracy. And often I worry that this is just another excuse for more and more bureaucracy. It's also wonderful that Japanese companies are doing more integrated reports, but a lot of them are really big, really long, filled with everything you could possibly want to know, which is great, but more information than real knowledge or focus. Um, Japanese companies have made a great first step, but I'd like to see more focus. Next page. So what are the opportunities and the challenge? And um, I guess one of, one of the, um, the opportunities is that, um, that this increased attention towards purpose to, um, to, um, to social um, and environmental responsibility is great for Japanese companies. Um, they can um, reconnect with some of their historical strengths and capabilities. But I think it really um, requires updating, refining, and broadening the definition and scope of sh stakeholders. I know that investors realize this, specialists in ESG realize this, 
I don't think senior Japanese managers realize this enough. I also think there's a danger of overconfidence and using words like purpose, like ESG, like social responsibility, like stakeholder capitalism as an excuse to avoid other, other things. And I see these terms thrown around, not really thought about and not really defined. So I, I worry about that. So the next page. So what, um, what can we see? What, what should Japanese institutional investors be doing? And again, um, I think institutional investors in Japan are doing a lot of this. They're making great progress, but I have high hopes for more. And one is that I would like to see them for my board companies and companies I know to push companies to go beyond just the ESG box ticking to presenting clear and specific and ambitious plans and targets that connect clearly to purpose. And I'm afraid that in my talk, I'm also confusing purpose and ESG a little more than I should. But I would like to see, um, see them pushing more on these bigger issues, the bigger picture purpose. What are you here to do? And how is this related to um, your, 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 your um, ES, um, especially ENS um, policies. I'd also love to see a unique and ambitious Japan voiced based view for, for ESG. And um, I'd love to see more focus on issues that are particularly important for Japanese companies or that Japanese companies are particularly well equipped to address. I think there's a lot of following global trends in Japan. I'd love to see more leadership. I don't know what that is, but I'd like to see more of it. I'd also love to see more focus on issues that are particular to Japan, um, social issues like foreign trainees, single mothers, income inequality here, disasters here. I'd love to see investors leading and companies leading global trends as well as following them and becoming a bigger voice in, so in Japanese society as a whole. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina. Very insightful uh, comments and uh, uh, just a small note uh, for viewers uh, in, in uh, outside Japan about Eiichi Shibusawa, who was the, uh, the father of capitalism in Japan. The, uh, it coincided uh, somehow that the, uh, he is now featured as the, uh, the, the, the Japanese uh, networks, uh, largest Japanese networks TV drama series, uh, which is similar to the Netflix The Crown. Uh, in Japan. So uh, there has been a lot of talk about uh, Eiji Shibusawa. And uh, that's, so the Christina's point, it was very much uh, related to the uh, this issue discussion about how great the Eiji Shibusawa was and all those things that have been going on in Japan. Okay, so uh, let's move on to uh, Yuki Ikehata from Asset Management One. Uh, he is the uh, the only practitioner uh, from the he's the only one from practitioners community today, and he's going to present how his his company has been uh, known for uh, stressing a lot of uh, importance on ESG issues. So we'd like to see his presentation about how his company is coping with the issue. Yuki, hello, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Just a moment, please. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me on this webinar. My name is Yuki Kehata from Asset Management One. I'm a ESG analyst of Responsible Investment Group and my responsibility is engagement with investee companies and exercise voting rights. Today, I'm going to talk to you about our strategy activities, mainly focus on engagement associated with our Japanese passive investments. I hope my presentation will contribute to understand our strategy activities and be useful for your research about the activities of institutional investors. Okay, uh, now let me introduce our company history briefly. Our company Asset Management One was founded in 2016 through the merger of the asset management companies and related 
related business units of Mizuho Financial Group and Daiichi Life Insurance Holdings. Although our company was founded in 2060s, we are historically active on ESG initiatives. Our former company has signed PROI in 2013 and formed a responsible investment group with dedicated ESG analysts at the same time as our company established. Our AUM is about 500 billion US dollars and have some uh, and, and have strong client base in both institutional and retail clients. Speaking of our portfolio of investment assets, the majority is traditional equity and bonds, and we have some multi-asset strategies and alternative assets such as if infrastructures. The AUM size and the strong client base are not the only things that differentiate us from other investment managers. This is, we have about 300 investment professionals and we have dedicated and seasoned ESG analysts who are former fund managers and analysts. And we actively collaborate with external stakeholders such as government agencies and global initiatives. These are also our important resources in our business activities. We use, uh, we use uh, the qualitative and quantitative information from these important resources in investment decisions, engagement, and exercising shareholder rights in order to maximize mid to long term investment returns and achieve sustainable development of society at the same time. The title of this presentation is our corporate message published in February this year. Uh, we have created this corporate message for sharing our purpose after a company-wide discussion from top management to employees. This message reflects the value we add as a committed long-term investor aiming to contribute to sustainable society and the well-being of our clients. This purpose will be integrated into all our corporate activities going forward. Now, uh, let's move on to talking about our basic thoughts on ESG and the process of our engagement. First, we, we don't think the effort of ESG initiative will necessarily be materialized immediately. Non-financial information, including ESG, is called future financial information because its initiative will be reflected financially over time. From planning to implementation, it takes a long time to incorporate them into corporate activities with, this, with leading to sustainable growth and increase sync corporate value. The difference in awareness of ESG is also reflected in the difference in the time horizon between investors and corporate disclosures. Until a few years ago, most corporate disclosures were mainly about single year earnings forecast and, and mid-term business strategies assuming the readers are short-term active investors. However, there are not enough for long-term investors, such as passive investors like us, because ESG initiatives are continuous as long as a company exists. Recently, the gap between, yeah, the gap become narrow since many corporations begin to publish their integrated report with financial and non-financial information. But we feel there are some lot, but we feel there are lots of room to improve in terms of uh, connectivity among their purpose, resources, business strategy, and governance aligned with their long-term value creation model. We have two major approaches to ESG, what we call return perspective and risk perspective. The risk perspective is the most common in ESG because mitigating ESG risk positively impacts uh, business resilience and sustainability 
and contribute to variation expansion through, through risk premium reduction. However, we highlight on the return perspective because that leads to business opportunity with providing the solution for environmental and social issues with increasing their growth potential. I would like to touch on our engagement starts here. We conduct about 2000 engagements annually and we have dialogue with companies equivalent to 80% of the topics index market capitalization. Sorry. Uh, looking, looking at the ESG theme, 70% of our engagement is reflected to ESG. This percentage has been increasing per year by year compared to about 50% in a few years ago. We have active discussion of governance and the ESG issue. The ESG issue on the pie chart means cross-cutting issues referred to multiple issues such as information disclosure and supply chain management. This is a description of our engagement process. You can see the 20 ESG issue on the left. In our engagement for passive investment in Japan, we select 200 companies from constituents of topics 500 index to focus in our engagement. And we set multiple material issues for each the focused companies, and we manage the progress of engage, engagement using the eight step milestones shown on the right. The slide shows our six priority themes in our engagement. In addition to global issues such as climate change and supply chain management, we are also focusing on the issues such as regional revitalization, which is becoming more serious with, big, with, the, with the declining birth rate and aging population in Japan. And the digital transformations that is Japanese companies are lagging in their efforts compared to foreign companies. This graph shows the progress of our engagement for the focused companies. Looking at this graph, you can see the milestone have progressed from the sharing of issues to the implementation of measures during the fiscal year. We don't think the effect of engagement don't appear in the short term, and we must wait wait for a time to identify the linkage to financial performance. However, I think it is important to man manage the progress of engagement in this way in detail and to have effective dialogues with companies depending on their business situations. Next, I'd like to explain how we are integrated ESG into our investment strategies. As we have many investment strategy to meet various clients needs, it is particularly important for us to have a common understanding and analysis of ESG status of the companies we invest in. For this reason, we provide both the quantitative and qualitative information to our internal analysts and fund managers. And each fund manager uses this ESG information in line with their policies and process of respective investment, investment strategies. Here is our in, engagement case with our pharmaceutical companies on the topic of governance and access to medicine. Our in-house analysts and fund managers, ESG analysts and voting specialists have a dialogue uh, with top management as well as the key person of R&D marketing, sustainability, or other departments associated with the objective of the engagement. Our team is very interactive, and we usually discuss a lot among ourselves about ESG issues of our investee companies. We enhance the effectiveness of our engagement activity by collaborating beyond the groups, depending on the situation. We are also actively working with external global ESG initiatives shown on, the, shown on this slide. It is difficult for a single country 
or a company to solve the challenges for creating a sustainable society. And we believe that it is important to work with many stakeholders on a global scale. With this in mind, we participated in global initiative on the environmental, social governance and information disclosures with engaging with the relevant global companies collectively. In addition, we encourage domestic companies to strengthen their ability to respond to global ESG issues by engage with them, uh, engaging them with the knowledge we have gained with participating in these global initiatives. Last year, uh, we became the first Japanese asset managers to join the Net Zero Asset Manager Initiative as a founding investors members. Although it is challenging to achieve net zero GHG emission by 2050, the negative impact of climate change has become more serious in various areas. So we recognize that asset managers have a significant role to play in accelerating the growth the global transition to net zero society. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, as a leading Japanese passive investors, we strive to contribute to the creating sustainable future through the power of investment. We look forward to continuing to work with a variety of stakeholders, including, including the academic community. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yuki. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation. And uh, the uh, we are working with Asset Management One to, to analyze their engagement record at the moment. And hopefully we are going to be able to report that in, uh, in the near future. Um, Again, the uh, so uh, we have a question Q and A session. So I leave uh, Marco and Hideaki to host the Q and A session. We have about ten minutes left before we uh, finish it off. Marco. Yeah. So thank thank you very much. So I think we had uh, two excellent presentations and two excellent comments. Uh, so let me maybe start with the question that we have. Uh, that we had submitted um, in English on Slido, and I think that goes to you, Rania. I think the question is, uh, could you say something, I mean, does your research say something about uh, Japan in particular and the Japanese uh, signatories? You, you mentioned Asia, but, you know, do you have any, uh, do you have any specific uh, examples for Japan? If you don't, that's fair enough as well, so. Uh, for, unfortunately, when we started this study, it was about, uh, you know, responsible investment around the world. So we didn't drill in so granularly into uh, countries, but obviously that's something that, uh, you know, could be repeated at, uh, with a more zooming approach to Japan. But at this point of time, unfortunately, the answer is no. Okay, that's, I think there's demand, so maybe. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, Iko, maybe you want to read, because we also had a question in Japanese and you translated. Oh, yes, I, I enjoyed it with this Ma question. Yeah, so maybe, okay. Hideaki, you can, you can handle the one in Japanese. Yes, so there is a question uh, from uh, Japanese participants, and uh, he or she said uh, that, uh, so uh, uh, Christina's presentation is quite interesting. And uh, the, his, his question is, the, uh, what is the role of ESG score uh, in Japan? And he is worried that uh, Japanese people is too much paid attention to uh, ESG score and uh, uh, say a box checking, a box ticking activity is very uh, popular. But uh, in the future, how to use uh, ESG score in Japan? So do you have any opinion? Sure. So um, of course, ESG scores are very important. And it's very good to get a thorough and comprehensive um, idea of what's going on. But I think it's also important to 
to choose um, one or two or three main themes that are, are uh, most closely related to companies' purpose, their model of value creation. I know in Japan, everyone's talking about materiality, but nobody really understands what that actually means. And so I just say, focus on a few things at the same time. Ask companies, what are they doing about climate, for example, drill down and get the specifics. So I think it's a combination of wide ranging scores, but really close focus on a few key issues. Okay. So uh, uh, can I continue? So there is another question. I think the... Uh, Are there uh, anyone who wants to comment on that point here from... Uh, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. So another question is the uh, so the role of cross shareholding in Japan and uh, a question a question said that uh, can it be seen as a kind of a responsible investment? Uh, so do you have any comment on that, Colin? So uh, yes. uh, the, uh, relation between cross shareholding and uh, recent uh, needs of uh, responsible investment? Yes. So. Cross shareholdings are currently the form of dominant block holding in Japanese companies. Uh, and they uh, can clearly play an important role in terms of encouraging a greater focus on what is of benefit to uh, Japanese society more generally uh, than just the interests of investors in one particular firm. Uh, and so uh, in particular, if one looks at it in relation to, for example, the supply chain of a company or the distribution firms from a company, then uh, cross shareholdings essentially are ways of internalizing what might otherwise be significant externalities that exists between different parts of the supply chain and that one certainly observes in relation to global supply chains. So, so, so there is a possibility of companies providing effective oversight and governance uh, of, of each other. On, on the other hand, what's been observed until recently is too much in the way of an internal control market through cross shareholdings and not enough of the element that comes from uh, the potential benefits of having outsider investors. And here I'd like to just pick up on I what I thought was a very important point that Christina uh, was making in her presentation and her sense that the, the, the focus on Japanese responsibility has been limited to communities and employees as stakeholders. Now, that, that, that is in essence what one would expect uh, in a system in which the, uh, the, the, the governance is dominated by cross shareholdings within companies. Uh, as against what I was emphasizing in my presentation, that the outside institutional investors are concerned about global systemic risks. Okay, so the, the, this focus by block holders in the case of Japan cross shareholdings on local issues, communities and employees, is, is precisely what you'd expect to observe as against the focus that you'd anticipate from uh, the sorts of uh, engagements that uh, we heard Yuki talking about in Asset Management One, which are focused on the ESG measures, which are much more of, of, of a global nature. And interestingly, uh, work that we've been doing on family ownership uh, in other countries comes to exactly the same observation. You might think that family owners are good long-term investors, and they, and they probably are. But in terms of their ESG performance, they seriously underperform uh, institutionally held companies. Uh, 
they are very much focused on looking after the well-being of their employees and they're very much more trusted by employees than listed companies. And the same goes for local communities. But family-owned businesses treat uh, their responsibilities as essentially looking after their, uh, their wider family interests, including their employees and their communities, but not extending to the global environment and society around the world. And that's why the move towards a greater involvement of in particular foreign institutional investors in Japan alongside uh, the cross shareholdings is a very important development in getting that balance and greater focus uh, on a broader societal uh, interest as well. So, Iko, I think we are almost out of time, but uh, I've read through several of the comments and I think uh, people uh, uh, echo basically something that Christina said, which is that, uh, yeah, ESG is fine, but um, it shouldn't be an excuse. And people also want change. Uh, and also, they don't want ESG to be an excuse uh, to for lower performance. So I think that comes through very clearly. And you know, I would now ask the question, but I think we are run, run out of time. Colin did mention Engine One in the US. I think that was a watershed uh, where we are seeing the merger of what we talked about last time, which is uh, activis hedge fund activism and ESG. Uh, and of course, uh, Rania mentioned, actually, you know, your numbers were on engagement were actually high, higher than in other reports I've seen. So this really seems to be the way. So maybe that's where the push is going to come from. Uh, so maybe engine number one is mm. just the first of these engines and it might be coming to Japan as well. So at least that's my personal take. And you know, I turn it back to you, uh, Ika. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I very uh, live for the discussion and uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> a lot of things uh, should happen in, in Japan and the, the role of uh, uh, the practitioners such as Yuki should be large the, uh, in the future, uh, even more the, the important now that we have come to this kind of discussion about, you know, uh, ESG washing or the uh, the uh, box ticking and all those uh, pro potential problems that can happen as a consequence. Okay, so uh, with this, uh, we are running out of time. So uh, we'd like to ask uh, Professor Miyajima uh, to, uh, for his final comments, uh, okay. remarks, and then uh, about the, uh, the next webinar, which is the last one of the five part series. So uh, please, uh, Miyajima Sensei. Yes. Um... So thank you, uh, Colin and uh, Lana. Uh, so it's a very excellent presentation. And Chris and Ikehata-san, uh, thank you for your uh, insightful comment. So today we learned the role of institutional investor and got many uh, important uh, implications uh, for Japan. So next topic is uh, the purpose of the corporation and how to realize its purpose, uh, inviting the top executives from business world and uh, management science area uh, with Colin. And uh, so today, uh, Chris uh, suggested uh, recently the uh, Japan uh, is discussing about the uh, new stakeholder models or the uh, new version of uh, Sampo Yoshi or this kind of idea. So this issue will be addressed in our last episode of, uh, of this webinar series. So uh, the date is the 21st uh, July and the time is the same time but extending 10 minutes. And we will have three uh, presenters. Uh, first one uh, is the uh, Endo uh, Nobuhiro, uh, who is NEC Corporation Chairman, as well as the uh, Japan Association of a Corporate Executive. And then uh, Colin Mayer and Judy Kanos uh, will follow uh, Endo's presentation and uh, discuss about the uh, purpose of a corporation. And we uh, also have a commentator, uh, uh, Kasai-san uh, from Japan Business Federation. So again, thank you so much uh, for uh, your presentation and all the audience, thank you for your participation. I'll see you uh, next time.
Bye-bye.